starting a brand new series today, and it's on relationships, and it's called These People. These People. And um, it's called that because every single one of us have gotten off the phone. We've walked out of, you know, a family function. We, we, we've left our office, you know, from a meeting. We've put our head down. We've closed our eyes, and we've prayed, God, deliver me from these people. We've all prayed that at some point. And, um, and, and here's the deal. It, it could be different. For you, these people could be the neighbor that lives behind you. It could be the boss that's over you. It could be the person who sleeps beside you. But there are these people in your life. And, and listen, it don't matter how you label these relationships. They are draining. Draining is what they are. They will drain and deplete all the energy out of you. They, they will, will, will use up all the patience. They have had you considering moving to the woods where no one will ever find you again because they're just this draining. Like I see a lady already say, I got a witness right here. They're draining these relationships are, okay? And, um, and he, here's the thing. I get it. I, I mean, you live it. I live it. I get it. But one of the things that we have to realize is, is that when you're in a really difficult or draining relationship, there gets to be a point where you just want to quit. Like you want to quit dating. You want to quit your, your degree because of this professor. You want to quit your job. You want to pull back. You want to put up walls. You just don't want to participate anymore because there gets to be a point where you're so drained, you just don't want to fool with it anymore. And, and, and all I'm saying is, is that there's a cost to that that you should be aware of, a cost to that. And the cost, it it really foils into this, it it costs you God's purpose for relationships in your life. It costs you God's purpose. You say, what is God's purpose for relationships? Well, let let me make it clear. Um, In Genesis, God creates, we get to read all of creation, the creation story. We get to see how God created the seas and the trees and the animals. And there's this pattern where God will create something, and then he will, he will pause, reflect on it, and he says, it is good. And, um, and he does that again and again. Well, he, he makes the, the, the seas, he makes the animals, he makes the fish, he makes, you know, the mountains, he makes all of it. And he says, it's all good. And then he makes Adam, and for the first time, he goes, that's not good. And, and, the, and, and you say, well, why, why, why is it not good? Well, God, when he looked at Adam, he saw that something was missing. And, and he starts looking, and, and here's what he noticed. That Adam alone could not fulfill his God-given purpose. That he needed someone else, he needed a person to help him fulfill his purpose of populating the earth and, and beginning to rule over the earth. And so God makes Eve. Well, if Adam couldn't fulfill his pur- purpose without another person, you can't fulfill your purpose without another person. That, that, that as much as you want to draw back and put up walls and say, I'm done with these, these relationships... You need people in order to fulfill the purpose God has for your life. And and, and listen, we all know that that, that a difficult relationship will cost you your purpose. And that's why your spiritual enemy likes to work and sow in dysfunction to your relationships. He knows that in a difficult relationship, it disables your purpose. It it makes your heart toxic. It makes your outlook negative. It it, it gets you to the place where your faith's faltering, and and you just don't want to do anything for anybody, including God, because you're so frustrated with these these difficult relationships. And so I, I just really feel that over the next few weeks, I'm supposed to help you handle those difficult relationships the way Scripture would say to handle them, so that you can regain your So I'm going to be talking next week about critical people. I'm going to talk a week after that about controlling people. And I'm going to talk a week after that about the people that just make you crazy. Like that's the only label that is appropriate for those people. And here's what I believe will happen. I really believe this all my heart. The draining will stop, the peace will return, and you will start being able to pursue your purpose in God again and won't be disabled by these relationships. And so, so, so I want to help you do that. Now, today, I'm giving you the foundational message for the rest of them. Like, if there's only one you could get, I want you to get today's. And, and here's what it's called. It's called the key to all relational success. The key to all relational success. Now, I know that's lofty, and that's a, that's a pretty big claim, but this is the key to all relational success. And listen, it's not taught by me. It's actually taught directly by Jesus in John chapter 4. And, um, and, and I want to give you a little context before I read you the passage. Jesus and his disciples are traveling one day, and they go through a village called Sychar in an area of Samaria. 
And, and this is an area they normally wouldn't spend much time in. It's about noon. And so Jesus um, tells the disciples to go on and pick up lunch, and he's going to sit and rest by a well, like where you get water, a well. Now, it looks like it's just, it looks like it's almost like uh, accidental, like he's just taking a rest. But God never does anything by accident. Everything's by intentionality. And the reason he's setting it this well is because he wants to teach this uh, person he's about to meet and all of us the key to all relational success. So let, let me read you the passage in John 4, starting with verse 7. It says, Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. And he was alone at the time because the disciples had gone to the village to buy some food. And the woman was surprised for the Jews refused to do anything with Samaritans. So there's some racial tension taking place. And she says to Jesus, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Why are you asking me for a drink? And Jesus starts to reveal to her that this isn't actually about getting a drink of water. He wants to use this well and her bucket as an example to teach her about relationships. So um, it, it goes to the next, next verse, and it says this. Jesus replied, if only you knew the gift that God has for you and who you're speaking to, you, you would actually ask me for the living water I have. And she says, but sir, don't, you don't even have a rope or a bucket. And she said, this well is very deep. So she thinks we're just talking about buckets and wells and water. She doesn't get Jesus is trying to teach her something. And, um, and, she said, and Jesus replied, anyone who drinks from this water, talking about this actual physical well, They'll, they'll become thirsty again. She says, this thing you got to come back to every day, again and again and again. He says, but those who drink from the water I give will never be thirsty again. And then she says, um, and, and Jesus continues, he says, because when, when you come to me, it will become like a fresh bubbling spring within you that will give you life. And she, she doesn't get it. She says, please, sir, the woman said, give me this water, then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come get water from here again. And, and so Jesus says, well, I still see you're not getting it, so let me just be real forward. And he says, I've been trying to kind of ease into it, but let me just be clear. And he says, okay, go get your husband. And, and she says, I don't have a husband. And, the, and Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the one you're living with now. And Jesus is saying, I'm trying to teach you something through this well and this bucket, but, but make no mistake, I want to talk to you about your broken relationships. See, most scholars will tell you that, um, that this passage is actually about worship because Jesus talks about worship. Some will say that it's about racism and it, and it, and it has some racial undertones. Some people will tell you that, that this passage is about Jesus empowering women, which he does and we fully believe in. I agree with all those. But at its core, the real reason Jesus is setting at this well is because he loves this woman. And his heart breaks because she has so many broken relationships. See, with Jesus, the principle never supersedes the person. He's always been about people. He continues to be about people. And this woman's a great candidate. If there was a spokesperson for dysfunctional relationships, she'd be the winner. She's had five failed marriages, and she's working on contestant number six. And listen, you, you have to understand, I mean, she's broken. She's drained after all these different men. She's tired. She's worn out. She, she's probably wondering, will this ever work? Will I ever find a relationship that's not broken? Will I ever be a part of something that, that doesn't turn into dysfunction? I mean, she, she just thinks she's the most unlucky woman on the planet. I mean, how could someone have five marriages and none of them work out? And, and she, she's just torn up by it. And, and it's real clear to see just from the details we get, she is stuck in an unsuccessful cycle when it comes to relationships. Maybe you're here today and you're stuck in an unsuccessful cycle when it comes to relationships. And what it's kind of, the, the common myth that propels it is this. We believe about relationships what this woman believes about relationships, which is this. It's an equation. Me plus the right people equals relational peace. Like, we think this. She thought this. Me plus the right boss equals good relationships at work. Me plus the right date equals the love of my life. Me plus the right friends with the right interests equal happiness when it comes to my friendships. 
me plus the right person equals relational success. And, and obviously this woman thought that because she's changing husbands quicker than I change underwear. I mean, she's moving through them trying to find the right person, trying to because she believes me plus the right person is going to equal the peace I've always wanted. And, and now here's the, here's the thing, though. There's a, the, the core problem with this equation is this. It's a misbelief that another person has what you need. It's, it's, a, it's a misbelief that there's another person on this planet somewhere that has what you need. And, and I really want to unpack this for you. And so I thought I would, I would use a, an example. Um, so I, will you just like take a moment and welcome my two friends, Laura and Brett, to the stage. Will you just tell them thank you for jumping in on the sermon today? Laura and Brett are, are just good sports. And um, they, they, they just helped me today. And they, they've been married about two years, right? They don't even know what they dislike about each other yet. Like, they're so early in it, they don't even know, but believe me, it's coming. And, um, and, and so um, they're going to they're gonna help me. Now, here's the thing. Um, how long did you guys date? How long did you guys date? Two years. Two years. Okay, two years. There we go. Isn't that the way it always works, you know? Um, so, so they entered into this relationship with a, with a cup that needed to be filled relationally filled, emotionally filled. I mean, we, we walk into every relationship needing to, to be filled. And listen, I know they're married. Here, turn this way just so, so uh, we get your better side. Um, th- th- they, they came into this as a marriage, but listen, this represents every relationship. It, it represents like boss and employee. Let me correct that. Boss and employee. It represents parent and child. <laughs> it represents friend to friend. I mean, that's just, we all walk into a relationship, um, no matter how deep or intimate it is, we, we come in with a cup that we're expecting the other person to fill because we're, we're empty. We, need, we expect something from them. And, and so what happens is, is that as Brett and Laura, they get married, um, they, they're, they're glad in the early years to, to, you know, give each other what they need. You know, he's glad to pour into her whatever she needs. And she's glad to, to pour into him with whatever he needs. But then, but then there gets to be a point where the needs start to get more demanding. And, you know, like, like, like she wants more attention because work's drawing him away. And, and, and he wants more appreciation because he works really hard. And, and she wants more alone time where we're not watching football, but, but we're talking about our feelings. And, and, and he wants more, like, kissing because that, that's just all he needs, you know. And, and it's back and forth and back and forth. But here's the problem with, with living like that is it's fine for a little bit, but then eventually they get to the place where, you know, one of us is always empty, and the other, well, their needs aren't fully met either. You know, it's like I'm not full and you're empty, and then there's times where you're kind of better, but I'm still empty. And, and so we start having these problems. And we get to the place where it's like, well, you don't really appreciate me. And you, you, don't, you don't appreciate what I do. And, well, well, you need to be more like your mama. Well, if I could tell you what your mama was like, you know, and we get into all that. <laughs> now, now, that's what happens. Am I working in the prophetic here, Brett? Right okay. Yeah. Um, so, so, so listen, the, but, but then you know what we do when we get to this stage? Like we're, we're, we're so tired of either being empty or just partially full, and we're so tired of meeting their needs and not my. You know what we do is that she starts going, you know what the real problem is, is I need a new they. Like I, I, I need somebody because there's somebody that can fill this. Like, and this guy at the office could feel this, or, or if I got a new boss, he could do this, or if I, I found some different friends, they could. And, and we start thinking, well, the problem is, is he doesn't have what I need. But that's why Jesus said, lady, you're coming to a well again and again and again. And you can keep showing up to this well, but it will never fill you up. Because you don't have a wrong person problem, you have a wrong source problem. He says, lady, the problem is not the people. The problem's the source. And, and he says, There's, you may not realize this, but you don't need another person. You need a different source. You, you need something that can give endlessly. Something that can give more. Something that doesn't start out half full. You need something that is an endless, infinite source. And lady, I'm that source. And then and you say, well, well, how does that translate to this relationship? I'll tell you how it translates. Is one day Brett starts to figure out that this isn't working. And as the man of his home, he says, you know what? I'm not going to push on her. 
I'm going to go to God. And I'm going to spend the first part of my morning with God. And then I'm going I'm to read my Bible. And I'm going to worship passionately. And I'm going to start seeking God for what he can do in my life. And I'm going to let him fill me to overflowing. And then the next day, he walks in, and she's ready to go back and forth. And he says, no, I'm good. How can I serve you? And then she goes, she goes, where did you, why, why, what's changed? Why do you got peace? Why, why, why do you have this joy? He says, I'll tell you about it. And the next morning, she shows up. And then she's like sitting, God, she lets God start fill her cup. And he starts speaking the things that she needs and starts working in her life and, and working all this. And next thing you know, we're not borrowing from each other. We're both showing up full to this relationship. Listen, listen, listen. Here's what Jesus is saying. Borrowing always leads to emotional breakdown. Borrowing, there's, there, there's never a point you will find somebody who you can borrow enough from to be full. But making God your source always leads to success. And that's Jesus' point. Lady, you'll never be able to borrow enough from this well to, to quench your thirst. But I can give you water that will take away that thirst, and you'll not have to come here again. And, and he basically says this, um, you can't expect from people what only God can give. You cannot expect in marriage, you cannot expect from your boss, you cannot expect from your kids what only God can give. Lady, it's not the wrong person, it's the wrong source. Now, give them a big hand, and I'm going to unpack this for you. So um, I think there are some of you here today and you feel like this lady, so frustrated, so frustrated with where your relationships are. I want to move very quickly and I'm going to give you the key to all, I'm just going to unpack what Jesus introduced and it, it's just a key, but it's a two-sided key. You got to do two things, just two things unlock relational success in any relationship. Here's the first one, got to move quick, stop looking to people for what only God can provide. Stop looking to people for what only God can provide. Okay, listen, um, God never created relationships to replace him. Like with, with, in the Garden of Eden, it wasn't Adam and Eve. It was Adam and Eve and God. He was as much a part as either one of them. And that's because only God can meet your deepest relational needs. Only God can. I'll show you. You have four major emotional relational needs. Four things you're looking from people that only God can provide. Here's the first one. Everybody wants acceptance. Everybody wants acceptance. The reason you chose the clothes that you wore today is because you want to be accepted. The reason you work so hard, the reason you perform at home, the reason you perform at work is you want to be accepted. And you know that if you wear the right thing, sound the right way, accomplish the right thing, you will be accepted. The problem is this. When it comes to people, their acceptance is limited. At some point, your fashion will go out of style. At some point, your performance will fail. And at that point, their acceptance stops. There is only one person that's ever walked the face of this planet that will always, unequivocally, always accept you, and his name's Jesus Christ. This is what he said in Hebrews 13. He said, for he himself, speaking of Jesus, has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Leave you refers to I will not physically leave you. Forsake you means I will not emotionally leave you. Listen, you're sitting beside someone right now, but if you're having issues with them, they're physically present, but emotionally they're distant. And forsake means I will not turn my heart from you. So here's what Jesus is saying in this verse. There will never be a moment, no matter what you do, that you will be out of my presence or that I'll turn my heart from you. That, that there will never be a day. Listen to me. God doesn't throw away people. On your worst day, he's still your best friend. He always accepts you whether you perform, whether you earn, whether you have, whether you have not. He always accepts you, and he's the only person that can do it. Here's the second one. Here's the second one. Um, everybody wants security. We want people to make us feel safe. In this uncertainty of this world, we want to feel safe, and we look to people to do it. Now, um, now listen, I want to protect my kids. I do. But I'm limited. I don't know what's going to happen later today. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen next year. Therefore, I cannot provide security. But God can. Not only does he know the future, he holds the future. Nothing falls outside of his sovereignty and his rulership. 
And that means that he uniquely alone can protect you and provide for you and guide you no matter what the world throws at you. He's the only one. Here's the third thing that we want. We want identity. Listen, I want to know that I'm unique. I'm special, that I'm significant, that I'm not like made on some factory floor and I'm just a face in the crowd. And people will tell you who they think you should be. People will tell you who they want you to be. But only God can tell you who you were created to be. Because it was only him who fashioned you together with his own hands and he installed your own identity. Let let, let me say it this way. Um, I... For most of my adolescent life and my 20s, I was a very unloving, uncaring, critical, harsh person, very much. Um, and and um, a lot of it was out of insecurity and just, you know, I just, I was a very unloving person. And so when God called me to ministry, it was kind of odd. Like one of my friends said, like, you want to be a pastor? Don't they like people? Like, like that was his response, and he was right. Everything about my demeanor was opposite of what a pastor should look like. So why would God call me to be a pastor when I looked nothing like a pastor? Because he knew my identity. He knew that in spite of a hard heart, he had installed the heart of a pastor on the inside of me, and with enough time, the Holy Spirit would tailor me into the, what he had, install, and he had made me to be. Listen, you know what that means? It means God knew who I was before I knew who I was. And and it's the same thing for you. Here's the the, the next one. We all want purpose. We all want purpose. Listen, all of us want to know we're here for a reason. We're not just in the rat race. Every person is asking subconsciously, why should I wake up tomorrow? And, and, And listen, people will tell you it's to make money. People will tell you it's to have fun. People will tell you that it's, it's to, to, to climb the ladder, to achieve fame, to have a position. And here's the problem. Many of you have done those things. You've had the fun. You've earned the money. You got the position. And when you got there, you go, this isn't what people said it would be. This isn't as satisfying as I thought it would be. This doesn't last like I thought it would. And, 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 and what's hap- you know, some of the most depressed and hopeless people in the world are successful people who believed if they got there, they'd be happy, and they got there, and they're not. And what I'm saying is when you make God your source, he gives you not a purpose that will flee, but a lasting eternal purpose. I can honestly say, and it's not because I don't have things go wrong and I don't face difficulty, I love waking up in the mornings because I know that God has given me a unique purpose. He has, he, I'm a child of God. I've got a calling of God. And he's given me uh, the ability to share the only hope that this world has. And my job is to bring him glory and love other people. And I will never tire of that. And you will never tire of that because he gives it to us and it's meant to be eternal. Listen, l- l- let me say it this way. And at any point, you don't trust God to meet these needs. You'll transfer the, transfer the responsibility to other people. At any point, you don't trust God to meet these four needs. You'll transfer that responsibility to a person. And every one of us at some point has treated somebody in our life like God. The problem is they don't have the ability to be God. They can, it's guaranteed to fail. Which is why Jesus said to this lady, he says, lady, you can keep coming back with that bucket, but you're going to stay thirsty. I, on the other hand, can quench that thirst forever. I can give you something that no matter how many times you come to this thing, you will never find. It's only me. He's saying, lady, stop looking to people for what only I can provide. That's what he's saying. Now, here, here's the second part of the key. second part of the key is this. You're going to stop the first, but the second one is you're going to start allowing God to supply what you relationally need. So I'm going to stop looking to people for what God's supposed to do, and I'm going to start allowing God to supply what I relationally need. Um, Jesus says to her, lady, if you'll make me your source, there'll be a fresh flow of my power that will come in your life, like a fresh flow. It'll, it'll bubble up, and it's going to bring life. Can I tell you the most important decision you make concerning your relationships is this. Who's powering them? Because you're either spending your emotional power and energy or you're going to spend the Holy Spirit's emotional power and energy. You're going to supply all the relationship needs 
or are you going to let the Holy Spirit supply it? Major ramifications based on that decision, by the way. Major. And, 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 and Galatians 5 actually unveils what those two decisions look like. If you want to do it, here's what it looks like. If you want God to do it, here's what it looks like. Let me show it to you. Galatians 5, verse 19 and 21. Here's what Paul says. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature. Now, your, your version may read flesh. Here's all he's saying. When you try to do it in your strength, because your flesh doesn't want to be dependent on the Spirit. It wants to do its own thing. It wants to think, I'm fine enough to get a man. I, I'm smart enough to do the right thing. I, I can figure this out. I don't need counsel. I don't need, I don't need anybody but me. That's what your flesh wants you to believe. Now, li- listen. Paul says, okay, you want to choose the flesh? Let me show you what the result of the flesh is. And he gives us what the outcome will be. He says, here's the results of the flesh. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures. Now, before I go any further, let me stop. Here's what he's saying. If you do your relationships your way, you'll have sexual problems. Second thing he says, you'll have adultery and sorcery. You do relationships in your power, you'll have spiritual problems. Next he says, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition. You do relationships in your way, you'll have emotional problems. And then he goes on and he says, and then dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and all of the sins like these, you do, you do relationships your way, you'll have behavioral problems. This is what Paul says. The best your flesh can produce is sexual problems, spiritual problems, emotional problems, and behavioral problems. That's the best you can do in your strength. And anybody that's lived in their strength, that's exactly what we, you've experienced. Now, this doesn't take a genius to figure out. As a matter of fact, I was reading a, a, an article this week, and I saw a quote from the great theologian, Justin Bieber. <laughs> and here's what he said on that topic. I just think that as Christians and as believers, they understand that if you don't have God's Spirit working in your marriage, it just makes it more and more difficult to make it work and have peace and find happiness. Listen to this. Justin Bieber is worth hundreds of millions of dollars. He is famous like crazy famous. He can have any person in the world that he wants. I mean, it just, just, he could pick the right person. Listen, he's uber talented. And it took him less than a year of marriage to figure out, I don't have what it takes to make this thing work. I need God's spirit helping me make this relationship. If anybody should succeed, he's got what it takes. But he's already figured out. Some of us have been married 30 years and ain't figured it out. Took him 36 hours. And Paul says the same thing. Paul says, okay, that's what your flesh can do. He said, you want to see what the Spirit can do? Here's what the Spirit can do. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Listen, listen. Everybody wants this from their relationships. This is who you want to be married to. This is, this is who you want to work for. Th- listen, this is who your kids want to be raised by. Th- this is the friend you've been looking for. But the flesh can't produce it. Only the Holy Spirit produces this kind of person. And I'll tell you why. Here, here's the first thing. Um, God's power is endless. When, when the Holy Spirit's working in you, it's endless what he can do with your relationships. Listen, Jesus said to this lady, lady, if you knew the gift of God, you'd ask. And and I'm saying to you, if you knew how much mercy and how much grace and how much kindness and how much patience is in the Holy Spirit, you'd never try to do a relationship by yourself again. You'd ask and ask and ask and ask because it's endless. Listen, with the Holy Spirit's power, you can do anything relationally. You can forgive. You, you, can, you, you can wait. You can encourage. You can bless. Listen, when, when you have the whole, because it's not your power, it's his power. L- listen, I can be happy whether you meet my needs or not. I can be kind whether you are or not. I can be loving whether you loving or not because I have a source pouring into me again and again and again. And it is endless what the source can provide for me. 
I can, I can be in any relationship because I have an endless source. But listen, it's not only is it endless, it, it's effective. The Bible says that this woman left this moment with Jesus, goes back to the town she came from, goes into the town square, and announces that she has found something to finally satisfy her thirst. And listen, that catches people's attention because they know how thirsty this lady is. Listen, they know her reputation. And when she shows up and says, I found something that is better than any man, they say, what? And the Bible says that they followed her out to Jesus, they listened to him, and they all chose to follow him. How powerful and effective is God's power? In one conversation, Jesus turned a broken woman into a world changer. One conversation. Imagine what he could do in one conversation with you, him guiding it instead of you guiding it in your relationships. Listen, you can trust God with your relationships. Here's why. No one is better at broken relationships than Jesus. I'll tell you why. He fixed the most broken relationship in history. You and your heavenly father. Because of your sin, there's nothing you could do. There's nothing you could earn. There's no amount of apologies that would have fixed the distance between your sin created. But Jesus stepped in and remedied it and restored the relationship that you're setting in today. So if he can fix that, don't you think he can fix all the others? Now here, here's the last one. His power is available every day. That's the best news. Every day. All you got to do is show up and let him fill your cup. That's all you got to do. And that's why it's so important. I know sometimes we, it's almost like we want things to be more complicated. All you got to do is show up every morning and spend time with God. You just have to open the Bible. You don't even have to read about relationships for him to work in you through relationship power. You, you don't even have to pray about relationships, and he'll give you relationship power. Listen, you don't even have to worship about relationships, and he'll give you relationship power. You just have to get in his presence, and he fills up your cup. Listen, every time you make God first part of your day, he loads you up with what you'll need for the people you'll encounter that day. Listen, this is the secret. This is the key. The key to this relationship thing is this. The key to all relationship success is experiencing God's power every day. That's the key. That's all you got to do is show up and fill up and go out and live it out. L listen, and, and you'll see it happen because there's going to be days you want to blow up and days you want to give up, but there his presence will be working with power to bring peace to that relationship. Um. I remember that um, there was a season where Kayla and I had a very, very, very dark season in our marriage. And, um, I mean, it, it was bad. I mean, we were angry at one another. We were pouring out everywhere else. We weren't pouring into each other. And, and um, I mean, you could cut the tension with a knife. I mean, we didn't, we didn't talk for days on end. And, and um, you know, it's even like one of those things like where you go to bed at night, like you hold your breath because you don't want her to know you're still alive. Like, you just want to... <laughs> And that didn't work because little did I know she, like, had the insurance number by the bed just in case I wasn't, like, you know. Um, I mean, it was just bad. It was a dark season. There were days that, and, and, and I'm going to be honest, there was nothing in us that wanted to remedy it. Nothing wanted to make amends. Nothing in me that wanted to go apologize or fix it or anything else. I mean, stuck in a cycle. And, um, but the thing that saved us is that although we had withdrawn from one another, each morning we still drew near to God. And there will be those seasons where you don't like each other and you want to give it up, but you just keep drawing near to God. And on the sixth day, we um, were in different parts of the house having our time with God, just reading, praying, and little we didn't know what each other was doing. We both worshiping and so I, I was kind of finished up but I was still listening to the worship song and on my phone and I walked downstairs where she was and when I came into the room that she was it struck me as odd because my phone was playing a worship song and it was the exact same song her phone was playing and not only was it the exact same song but I, I'm just telling you as I walked in the room her the, the verse it was the exact same verse playing at the exact same time and, and, and they were perfectly in sync, like they were the same, like the same phone, but it was two different phones. It was so weird that I stopped and I thought, how weird is that? And in that pause, the Holy Spirit said, Joe, 
even when you and her are out of sync, I'm working to bring you back in sync. And I I just can't tell you, in the midst of, of a week of just pure frustration, an infusion of peace came in my heart. Listen, within hours, a week's worth of hurt was resolved and we were back to where we needed to be. Let me say it this way. Kayla and I, the only reason we're married, and, and she's amazing. I love her with all my heart. But listen, even the best people can't give you what God only can give you. The only reason Kayla and I are married is not because of ability. It's not because of compatibility. We're only married today because of God's power. We're only married because there were moments that we showed up and didn't have what the other person needed, but the Holy Spirit provided it. He's done it for us for 12 years, and he'll do it for you. At your job, with your friends, in your marriage, in your dates, if you'll let him be the source, you'll never thirst again for what people can't give you anyways.